Today, we're diving headfirst into the mind-bending world of quantum computing. And I know some of you are thinking, quantum computing, it just makes no sense. But don't worry, because I'm here to break it down into bite-sized, easy-to-digest pieces that anybody can wrap their head around. By the end of this 10-minute journey, you'll not only understand what quantum computing is, but also why it's set to flip the tech world upside down. So grab a coffee, kick back, and let's embark on this quantum adventure. But let's start with the very basics. Quantum computing is a totally different beast from the classical computing that we're all used to. The kind of computing that powers your phone, your laptop, or that new Threadripper desktop. At its heart, quantum computing uses the principles of quantum mechanics, the science of how things behave at the tiniest scales, like atoms and electrons, to process information in ways that classical computers could only dream of. And so what's the big difference? Well, as you know, classical computers use bits as their building blocks. A bit is super simple. It's either a zero or a one like an on-off switch. Everything your computer does, from streaming this video to running your favorite game, is built on millions of those little zeros and ones flipping back and forth. Quantum computers, though, they use something called qubits or quantum bits. And here's where it gets weird. Unlike regular bits, qubits can be a zero or a one or both at the same time. And you heard that right, both at once. This magic trick is thanks to a quantum property called superposition, and it's the key to why quantum computers have so much potential. But before we get too far ahead, let's unpack that idea a little bit more. Whether you think of a qubit as having no value at all, or both values are all possible values at the same time, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is how they actually respond to algorithms. Now, to make superposition less of a head-scratcher, let's use an analogy. Picture a coin. In the classical world, you flip it, and it's either heads or tails. Simple, right? Well, that's like a classical bit, a zero or a one, one state at a time. Now, imagine that same coin in a quantum world. Instead of landing on heads or tails, like when it's still spinning in the air almost, it's representing both heads and tails at the same time until you stop and check it. And that's superposition in a nutshell. A qubit can exist in multiple states at once until it resolves. Why does this matter? Well, on a classical computer, you have, let's say, three bits, so you can represent one of eight possible combinations at a time, like 000, 001, 010, and so on. But with three qubits in superposition, a quantum computer can represent all eight of those combinations simultaneously, add more qubits, and the possibilities explode exponentially. With just 300 qubits, a quantum computer could represent more states than there are atoms in the observable universe. Let that sink in for a second, because this ability to handle multiple states at once is what lets quantum computers tackle insanely complex problems way faster than classical machines. Imagine that you had enough qubits to represent a 256-bit encryption key. Theoretically, since the qubits can represent all possible states and combinations at the same time, it's only a matter of selecting the ones that resolve the decryption key. Superposition allows a quantum computer to process all possible keys simultaneously, but there's still a catch. When you measure the qubits, the superposition collapses to a single state, one key, with probability proportional to its amplitude squared. In a uniform superposition, each key has an equal chance of being measured, so a single measurement is really no better than a random guess, which would be equivalent to classically brute forcing a key one at a time. To deduce the correct key, you need a quantum algorithm that amplifies the amplitude of the correct key's state, or otherwise exploits quantum properties to somehow identify it efficiently. Because without going too deep into the weeds, the most common algorithm is one known as Grover's algorithm, and the basic idea is to iteratively apply a series of quantum operations that enhance the probability of measuring the correct key. It starts with a superposition of all possible keys, and then uses an oracle to mark the correct key by flipping its phase, followed by a diffusion step that amplifies its amplitude. After roughly a number of iterations equal to the square root of the key size, the correct key's amplitude is boosted enough that measuring the qubits is likely to yield the right answer, providing a quadratic speedup over classical brute forcing. But superposition is just one piece of the puzzle. There's another quantum trick up the sleeve that takes things to the next level, entanglement. Okay, entanglement is where it starts to feel a little bit like science fiction. When two qubits become entangled, they're linked in a way that's almost spooky. Einstein called this spooky action at a distance, and it still blows minds today. So here's an analogy to help wrap your head around it. Imagine you've got two coins that are entangled. You flip one and it lands on heads. Instantly, the other coin, whether it's across the room or across the galaxy, lands on heads too. They're perfectly in sync, like they're sharing some kind of cosmic connection with no time delay. In quantum computing, this linkage lets qubits work together in ways that classical bits can't, amplifying their power to solve problems. 
When you combine superposition and entanglement, you get a machine that can juggle tons of possibilities at once and coordinate them perfectly. That's why quantum computers can take on tasks that would leave even the beefiest supercomputers in the dust, like cracking codes or simulating molecules or optimizing massive systems. Speaking of which, let's talk about what quantum computing could actually do for us. So why should you care about all this quantum computing weirdness? Because it's not just a cool science experiment anymore. It could change the world. And here's some big areas where quantum computing is poised to make waves. Number one is cryptography. Right now, most of the internet's security, like your online banking or those encrypted messages you send, rely on math problems that are really, really hard for classical computers to solve. Take a 256-bit encryption key, for example. A classical computer would need billions of years to crack it. But a quantum computer? It could potentially do it in hours or even minutes using another algorithm called Shor's algorithm. And that's a game changer, both a threat and an opportunity. It means we'll need new quantum resistant encryption methods soon and quantum tech could help us build them. We could also save lives faster because in medicine, creating new drugs is a slow, expensive process. And a big part of that is simulating how actual molecules interact, something classical computers struggle with because these calculations are so complex. Quantum computers could possibly zoom through these simulations, modeling molecules down to the atomic level. That could mean faster development of life-saving drugs, from cancer treatments to vaccines, cutting years off the process and getting help to people who need it sooner. AI and machine learning are already transforming the world, but they're hungry for data and computing power. Quantum computers could supercharge them by processing the massive data sets way faster than classical machines. Imagine training an AI model in minutes instead of days, or building systems that learn and adapt in real time. That could lead to smarter assistance, better self-driving cars, or even breakthroughs in robotics. And ever wonder how companies figure out the fastest delivery routes or the best stock portfolios? Those are optimization problems, and they get insanely complicated as the number of options pile up. Classical computers have to grind through possibilities one by one, but quantum computers can explore tons of them all at once. And that could be more efficient supply chains, cheaper energy, or even helping scientists design better materials. And those are just the tips of the icebergs. Quantum computing could also tackle climate modeling, financial forecasting, and even fundamental physics questions that we haven't cracked yet. It's not just about doing things faster, it's also about doing things we couldn't do before. Now, before you start picturing a quantum PC on your desk, let's pump the brakes a bit. Quantum computing is still very much in its early days, like in the vacuum tube or maybe even relay era of classical computing. We've got a long way to go before it's ready for prime time, but the progress is very exciting. Big players like IBM, Google, and Microsoft are pouring billions into quantum research. Back in 2019, Google made headlines when their Sycamore processor achieved quantum supremacy. It solved a super-specific problem in 200 seconds that would have taken a classical computer 10,000 years. IBM's got their quantum experience letting developers tinker with qubits in the cloud. And startups like Rigetti and D-Wave are pushing the boundaries too. But there are some big challenges holding us back. Qubit stability is one. Qubits are fussy little things. They need to be kept at temperatures colder than outer space, like minus 460 Fahrenheit, which is about 275 below Celsius. And even then, tiny vibrations or even electromagnetic noise can mess them up. This is called decoherence, and it leads to errors in calculations. Fixing those errors is tricky. Quantum error correction needs extra qubits to double-check the work, which makes the whole system more complex and expensive. It's like trying to proofread a book while somebody's shaking the pages. Right now, we can build quantum computers with dozens of qubits. Google's got 53, IBM's hit 65, but practical applications might need thousands or millions of them. Scaling up without losing control of these delicate qubits is a massive engineering puzzle. Still, the pace of innovation is actually picking up. New materials, better cooling systems, and smarter algorithms are chipping away at these hurdles. We're not there yet, but we're definitely on the road. In short, your classical computer is a trusty workhorse for daily stuff, while quantum computers are like rocket ships built for exploring uncharted territory. They're not here to replace your laptop, they're here to solve the unsolvable. So what's next? Where is this all heading? Well, the experts reckon we're maybe a decade away from quantum computers hitting the mainstream. Think 2030s or so. When that happens, industries like healthcare, finance, and security could look totally different. Imagine drugs designed in months instead of years, or AI that's way smarter than anything we've seen yet. But it's not just about practical stuff. Quantum computing could help us crack the big mysteries, like how the universe works at its deepest levels or how to build the perfect climate models. It's the kind of tech that doesn't just improve what we have, it opens doors that we didn't even know existed. So there you have it. We've covered the basics, qubits, superposition, entanglement, and why it matters. It's a wild, fascinating field that's gonna shake up the world and we're just getting started. 
If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you consider subscribing to the channel and leaving a like on the video before you go today. If you've got questions, drop them in the comments. I do love hearing from you. I read them all, and we answer the best ones every Friday on Shop Talk. Check it out at the link in the video description. In the meantime, and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.